Everybody, get your attention. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, gosh, this is the one we should have charged a lot of money. <laughs> We'd have an endowment going. I think we did. Um, it's a terrific crowd. I think we're going to have Mark every program now. <laughs> I'm going to give it over to Joe Sedroga, who's going to introduce Mark. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you, uh, yeah, so many here, it's hard for me to keep going back and forth to see all of your eyes. However, I am very happy to be here today and on behalf of the Conway Historical Society Museum. Um, it's, it's been a long wait. I, when I first uh, saw Mark in spring, I asked him if he would talk about Ernie, his grandfather. It was immediate. There was no hesitation. This was like a, you know, it's the, the perfect thing to ask. So I was very pleased and then the follow through until today. So, so I'm more excited than I can ha actually handle it right now. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to speak too much time, but just a couple of things. How many people actually knew Ernie Stalin has actually spoken to him? So, all right, there's a pretty good showing of Ernie. Because he, he lived next to me, and he was quite a character. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say, because the rest is up to you, Mark, to tell us more about Ernie. And, uh, I'll keep it clean. <laughs> So because early, he, he walked the hills, he walked the mountains, he walked the valleys, he walked in the streams of Conway. Remember all the places that he's gone. So if Mark can share with us some of the stories that he shared with uh, Mark and then uh, with us, then that, that would be fantastic because we're looking forward to it. Happy to okay, do let's uh, give a warm welcome to Mark. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming first and foremost. And I'd like to get my hands on the guy and put the building that I'm a great a storyteller, because in my, in my world that means I'm full of malarkey. <laughs> but uh, um, I promise you everything I'm going to tell you tonight is, is true, and the reason I know it's true is because I made it up myself. <laughs> so, but no, really, everything that I'm going to tell you tonight is based on what I remember as a kid from what my grandfather would tell me. So we'll, we'll start with uh, when he was, he was born on, he was a 4th of July baby, he was born on the 4th of July. And uh, his name was Ernest Alphonse Stalin. He was born in 1905. Some people called him Ernie, some called him Ernest, some called him Fat Stalls. To, to us, he was Gramp. Now I see my brother's here, my cousin David's here, we call him Gramp or Gramp. That's, that's what we call him. Now his father was Alphonse, and for those of you who follow the, the trolley history, his father Alphonse was, uh, he worked for, um, Van O'Connell contractors, and they let him drive the first spike in the trolley rail line. He, he drove the first spike. He worked for the trolley lamp, uh, rail line. He was a, a freight handler. He helped fix the tracks, and then he became what was called a motor man. He was actually a conductor on that trolley. And he was the last man to ride the trolley when it was decommissioned, I think it was 1920-something. And then uh, he rode it to the point where a salvation, a sal uh, salvage company took that, 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 that car and from North Adams and they just tore it apart. And all the track from the trolley went into the dam uh, at, uh, uh, and I think it was the Whitingham Dam in Vermont. All that track was used as reinforcement in the Whitingham Dam. So uh, there, there's some history there. So when, when, grand, when our grandfather grew up in this town back in 19, early 1900s, it was a different town than we know now. There were no trees, hardly, because there was so much farmland. Um, the industry was still semi-going. There were a lot of mills and a lot of, a lot of uh, ponds on the river. And uh, um, there were two big reservoirs at that time that he, he, uh, he lived so if you go up towards Ashfield from the covered bridge, there's a red house on the left, and I apologize, I don't know the name of those people, but that's where he grew up. <clears throat> and behind that house, starting from just below the covered bridge, you can still see the old dam right there. The reservoir went all the way up to a cement bridge right by Riley Road, and then you'll see another remnant of a dam, and then there was another reservoir above that. And all down through there are other mill ponds because there are tons of mills but because he lived there he used to fish that that reservoir all the time they had a boat and believe it or not from the covered bridge all the way up they would fish in that in that reservoir and this was a spear that he used to use to, to catch eels at night he'd go out at night with a lantern and he'd, he'd shine it and i used to 
do it myself in the Connecticut River. He would spear the eels, and he, uh, he was, well, I can't repeat it, but those slimy SOBs, he, <laughs> <laughs> he liked to eat them, but he didn't like to touch them, and he, he'd roll their tails in the dirt to, to break the skin, and then tack them to the barn door and skin them, and then, and then they would eat them. And uh, I, Nicholas just brought me this. I was going to tell this story, but this clarifies it. Our great-great-grandmother was killed on her back porch. There were two men, three boys in a boat. And what they were doing was, uh, as my brother can tell you, pickerel, which is a fish. At, me. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, pickerel is a fish, and at night, they come to the edges of shore. Remember when we used to catch crawfish? They come to the edge of the shore, and they sleep at the edge of the shore. We used to hit them with a bat. These gentlemen, uh, as my grandfather told me, they were shooting the pickerel with a 22. And the 22 ricocheted off the water, struck our great-great-grandmother in the stomach and killed her. She was, wow. she was shelling beans on the back porch. And this, uh, I was uncertain as to the date and all the exacts, but thank you, Nicholas. Nick brought that in tonight. So um, anyway, the, that was a, the, the, there were those two reservoirs, and Grant loved to fish. Now, the South River went all the way down to what is known as the Conway Station, where the Big Dam is. And when he was a boy, that was a lake from the dam up, and uh, there was a boathouse. And I took Joe and Mr. Borton for the walk, and I showed them where the boathouse used to be. Now, there was Wildwood Park. That was on the side of the road where the, where, uh, the trolley went through. And that was a, like a pavilion and a, and a, I don't know, it was a really cool place from what I understand. But anyways, the boathouse, for some reason, if somebody knows why, they, they could tell me, the boathouse was on the other side of the river, and it was accessible from Lucart Road, where the Murphy's home. Why? I don't know. But Grandpa used to go and take that boat and fish, fish that whole lake. And I remember saying to him, Grandpa, how did you get the boat down the river? Because right now it's just a river. And he said, well, God, well, boy, you got to remember. He called everybody boy. Uh, he said, you got to remember, back then that was a lake. He said, and that lake was as deep. As the, as the dam is tall. So, and that lake went all the way back to where Picard, there's a stream that comes out of Pekarski's property and Murphy's property, and it runs in. And that lake went all the way back to that stream. And uh, he, he used to fish that reservoir as well. And um, I remember one time when I was a little boy, we used to go trout fishing every Saturday morning, and we would, uh, there was this one place, it was the most, of course back then all the streams were full of trout. You could catch your limited trout like nothing, but there was one place where it was just beautiful pool after pool after pool, and uh, we were coming out of there from fishing, and uh, Gramp said, well let's sit down, boy, my, my, my hips are getting tired. So we sat down, and Gramp would always have blackjack gum or Beeman's gum, and he'd always have it in his pocket, and if I could answer all the, the trees. He'd say, what kind of tree is that? Yeah. I'd get a piece of gum. <laughs> uh, that day we were sitting there, and I was chewing my gum, and he was smoking his pipe. And in retrospect, I can remember a bunch of stumps all around. And uh, he's puffing on his pipe, and he's looking around. And he knocks out his pipe, and he goes, well, boy, he says, this is a, uh, it's kind of sad. He says, this is the last time we'll ever fish this place. And I can remember saying, well, why, Grant? And he says, because next year, this, this is going to be a lake. And what it was was uh, the Deerfield water off of uh, Roaring Brook Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if somebody knew their dates, I would, they'd know how old I was. But I, I can remember as a little boy. So uh, I can't even imagine what the people who lost their farms to the quad would felt. Because I can still remember the sadness on my grandfather's face for losing that fishing spot, which I, I thought was pretty cool. Um, that, was, that was, I'm going to say, <coughs> probably early June, because whenever we went fishing for trout, in April, we always had that greens with our trout for lunch. Early April, it was always uh, um, dandelion greens. And then in, in early May, the fiddleheads would be up, and then we'd pick the fiddleheads. And then when the fiddleheads were gone by, we'd always have milkweed, and then the garden would kick in, and we'd have stuff from the garden. But that day, I can remember, so it had to be early June, because I remember picking the ferns, and the ferns were already all gone by. And we used to put the ferns in our creels and wet them to separate the trout so they'd stay cooler, so that they wouldn't spoil on the way out if it was warm. 
so I, I, I know it was probably early, early June. So anyway, Grant was a, I was a hard working guy, even as a kid. He uh, did a lot of jobs. He was a grave digger. He uh, used to dig graves for some ridiculous price, of like 10 cents to dig a grave. And he told me a story, it was the Howland Cemetery. Don't ask me where it was, because it freaked him out, because all he would say was over there. <laughs> he, was, he was digging a grave one time, and he was in the hole, and he was shearing the sides to make it straight and look better. And he sheared a plank off, and there was an unmarked grave there. Oh. He never told anybody, and it's still there, so I don't know if anybody knows where it is. And like I said, I'd say, where was the grave? It was over there. <laughs> but he said it looked to him like it was a soldier, because it had like a woolen old ratty coat with big brass buttons, and whoever it was had long, long red hair. He, yeah, he didn't know if it was a male or a female, but there's somewhere, there's an unmarked grave in the Howland Cemetery that nobody really knows about. He used to chop wood. Uh, um, he he bra not bragged, because Grant wasn't a brag, he, he, but I don't know how to, just say that he used to, he used to cut wood, and he, and he said that he could cut eight cords of wood a day. Now that's not, that's with an ax. That's not cut, cut and splitting and stacking, that's just cutting the tree down. It's, you know, he could cut eight cords of wood a day, and in the winter he'd have to start fires and keep three axes in the fire, not the handles, but close to the fire, to keep the steel from getting too brittle so that when he was split, uh, cutting the wood, the, the, the steel would break because the cold would make the, the ax chip. So uh, he, he, he cut wood and he had some affiliation with, I don't know how many people know that way back up in the state forest there was a town farm for people that didn't have a lot of money and they would go up and they lived in the town farm. Hard to believe now because it's all grown, it's the state forest, but he used to go up and he used to work with the people up there at the town farm. And now I don't know if any of you have ever gone the, the, to the very end of, of the dump road, old Cricket Hill Road. Um, there's a there's a pond there now, but in the past you could drive right through to Four Corners and take a left, and that's where the town farm was. Well, what that that pond used to be a hay field. And my grandfather was 13 years old when he would go up there and work with the people. And then right around I don't know it was like right around 1978 or something. The, it turned into a pond again, and I, I asked why, and he said, well, the blind ditches let go, and, and back in the day, if they had an area that was wet, they would dig a main channel, and then they'd dig other channels, like say, say it was this the, the swamp that you wanted to turn into a field, they would dig a ditch down the main part of that, that area, and then they would dig other ditches leading to that, and then they would cover it with locust planks and put the dirt back on, all the water, you would never do it now, they were conservation commission, <laughs> but they put the dirt back on, and then he said, "All summer long, you had the nicest hay because it was always had plenty of water, and the hay would just keep growing and growing." But he worked with the people up there, and uh, he, that's where he shot his first gun. He told me, and uh, <laughs> he must must not have had a, a very good choke. He, he he said, "Well, I, I put it, I put every paint out in the barn window." <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the people were too happy, he said, but I the hell out of him. He, he, but, uh, um, so, anyway, and the interesting thing about that, where that pond is now, and even when the road went through, was there's always a beautiful brook going out of the, out of the east side of that, that area and out of the west side, but there was never any brooks coming into it, so it must have been, you know, very strong springs there, and, uh, one brook feeds the Maggie Bean Brook, and the other one feeds the brook that, that runs into the, uh, the Waitley Road. And then, this is the way Grandpa was, too. It's an another time we were going up the Waitley Road. You go just past, um, you go past the Conway Pool, and you go past where uh, the Warners live, and there's a little pond right there. You go just past that little pond, and we stop one day. He says, what, what do you see here, boy? I said, that is Grandpa. I see a swamp. He goes, no, look over there. He says, I see a swamp. He goes, look over there, I see a swamp. He said, you're not going to see this very often. He says, but the, the water on that side of the road runs to the east. The water on this side of the road, I mean to the south. The water on that side of the road runs to the north. Now you think about that. How many places do you know that that, 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 that happens, you know? 
So that was that was one of the things um, he, uh, he he showed me. But uh, why he worked with the town farm people, I don't know, because uh, they were poor, so they couldn't have paid him. But he would go up and he'd work hay. Pick there was an apple tree at the very end of that field. He would pick apples. Um, in fact, one time we were coming up to the town farm from the other way. We went up Cricket Hill Road. We took a right, and instead of going straight to Henhock, we took another right. And we're driving up, and Gramps driving his car. He got his arm out the window. He says, "See all those those red pines? They're they're red pines growing in a beautiful row. I don't know if anybody remem remembers that, but uh, his he said that's." That, when I was a boy, those were all fields. Now, now it's all just forests. But he says those were all fields, and my father planted all those trees. Now, while he's driving, there's a sharp stick attached to a branch that fell off a big tree. He's got his arm out. That sharp stick goes through his shirt sleeve, <gasps> like it didn't get his arm. And he's driving over there, this, and he doesn't stop, and his arm doesn't <laughs> and, and, and he's talking, and the shirt sleeve goes. Shh. <laughs> and then over there, and he keeps on talking. <laughs> That shirt sleeve hung on that branch for two years. <laughs> that is the God's honest truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was a graduate of the Conway High School, class of uh, 1923, the 20th of June. He was a graduate of the Conway High School, which is up on the hill where Mario Van Camp lives. Uh, and if you've seen any of the pictures, that's all overgrown now, too. And he lived in Conway his whole life, with the exception of when he moved. Brooklyn to go to a trade school to learn to be a mason. So he lived in Brooklyn, learned to be a mason, and that's where he, he stayed at a boarding school, and that's where he met our grandmother, Josephine Murray, and they got married and they moved back to Conway. Uh, he tried to work in the city, he told me, but he, I know, honestly, I, I don't know if it was a crooked organization, but he told me about he would bring a, a bucket of mortar, once, once he, he learned the trade, he'd bring a bucket of mortar up on the roof and he'd sit there all day and they wouldn't let him do anything and he'd bring that bucket of mortar down at the end of the day and he said, that lasted, boy, about two days. And I said, the hell with that. And he, <laughs> and he, came, and he came back to Conway. And uh, so that's where, uh, that's where he came back with his bride and my grandmother. And then uh, that's, that's where my mom comes into the picture. So my mom grew up. And she's somebody you should have talked some night if you want to if you want to hear some great stories. My mom grew up with a, a cool life with my grandfather. She grew up. Uh, uh, of course, times were hard for everybody back then. But her, she grew up eating game every day, pretty much every day. That's what they ate was game. And my one of the, my grandfather's professions was was uh, he was a, he was a trapper, and that's what these pictures are. That was him when he was young. And uh, my mom tells a cool story about they'd all be sitting at the kitchen table eating their supper and it'd be in the evening and it'd be dark and the door would open and if it was a good day on the trap line my grandfather's hat would come down the hall first. <laughs> now mind you they're all sitting at the kitchen table eating their supper and then and I don't want to offend anybody but this is the way it was with down down a mink would come down another mink would come down a fox would come and they'd slide into the kitchen while the family ate their dinner. My my grandfather processed the pellets on the kitchen. So, you don't you don't see that very often. Yeah, but uh, so anyway, um, yeah. Grandpa was a trapper. Now these are pictures of him of, of a, from November November first to December. By December first, everything was pretty much frozen up because I used to trap. And, um, you're, you're pretty much done. Now. That was a, like a year's pay, a year's in income for one month. It was a year's income. That picture right there was taken on December 6, 1941, which means this next day, Pearl Harbor was bombed. <coughs> All of that was worthless. Everything, they, they, that, they was, the fur trade was over, the war was on. They, they survived somehow, right, Mom? Eating wild things. Gramps spent the last 25 cents he had, the story has it, on fish hooks, because with fish hooks he knew he could feed his family. And his neighbor lived on potatoes the whole winter. Who was that one? Bert Lee. Really? Oh. Lived on potatoes? No, okay. he didn't eat his father. Yeah, yeah, huh. Yeah. So, anyway, so Pearl Harbor hit, the war was on, and, uh, you know, but Mom, you never remember being hungry or anything, right? Oh, no. no, you always had plenty. But Gramp had jobs during the war. One of his jobs was he was 
I don't know what you would call it. He was a warden because we were at war. You know, we didn't have radar. We didn't have satellites. We didn't know what was there. You know, I wasn't there, but they didn't. Uh, so Grant was a warden, and he would go around the neighborhood with a helmet on and uh, go to every every door and knock on the door and make sure that either lights were out or their shades were pulled because they didn't want we, they didn't want to get bombed either. They didn't, they didn't they didn't know if the Germans were going to come or bomb. And uh, did Grant carry a lantern when he did that? Mom? Flashlight. A flashlight. Okay. But he would walk house to house, knock on the door, pull your shades because they you know, they weren't sure if the Germans were going to attack the mainland or what. My mom remembers uh, Mrs. What was her name, Mom? What was your your teacher told you to? Oh, Mrs. Pina. The Pina. Oh, God. Mrs. Blackwood's backwoods there because the German bombers might come over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also at that time. Conway had a watch house <clears throat> where people took turns on station with binoculars looking for, it was up by yeah, Tony Borton's house up on the hill up there, and, and residents would take turns with binoculars watching for uh, enemy planes, and if you spotted a squadron of planes, you dialed in to Westfield, and then they would alert the town, Westover, West West Over, okay, they would alert the town well, on this particular day, two young ladies were in that watchtower with their binoculars, and they spotted a squadron and terrorized the whole town for a, for a flock of geese. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be my mom and her sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that for a flock of geese. And, uh, my mom tells stories about during that time the war effort peeling the tin the. Everything was rationed and peeling the tin foil off of the back of chewing gum wrappers and rolling little balls to save for the war effort, to save any little bit of metal that you could save, all for the war effort. And uh, this is how this is how you know times are different than they are now. For her, a treat for her was when the ice man came to give them a block of ice for their ice box. Um, a treat for them was to get a chip of that ice on a hot summer day, just a chip of ice. And that's, you know, you think about it, you know, we didn't, didn't have a freezer or refrigeration or anything like that. But, uh, so anyways, my mom grows up, and uh, at that time, the town hall, the first town hall, be, before it burnt down, they used to have uh, youth nights where, you know, all the kids would come down. How many kids would come down? There? A lot? I'd say 35 or 40. Well, okay. Yeah. And they would, they'd have youth? Conway Youth Center. The youth, okay. Downstairs in the town hall. Okay. And they would, they would play games and do all kinds of different things. And uh, my mom remembers a big giant potbelly stove with a guard in front of them. Maybe that's why it burned down. I don't know. But she remembers the big always going in the winter time to keep them warm. And there was a, a fellow there that obviously had his eye on my mom, but she was afraid of him. And my father took it upon himself to escort her uh, at night from the youth center back home and I was just you know and I said dad why did you do that he goes well she was a cute little S-H-I-T <laughs> <laughs> I said oh, okay <laughs> that was my father my father that's how my mom met my dad at the youth center he would escort her at home at night because she was afraid yeah he, they'd get under the street light and then he'd go because my dad lived up on the hill at the top of the hill um, where Will, I don't know what Will's last name is, but where Will is now. And uh, I don't know if they smooched or not. That's gross. I'm not going there. <laughs> but anyway, so that's... I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. So that's where, that's where uh, my mom met my dad. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I, you, you, you wish you could write down everything, you know. I wish I could go back and write down everything that he told me. You know, like uh, he talks about, um, like the Kerbin place, which is hard scrabble, because he knew some people that had a mill down there, and now it's there's nothing there. You know, he he talked about the Jerominic place, which is Norton Hollow. Now there's a big yellow gate off of Roaring Brook Road that goes in there, and I'll never forget one time we were driving down and Grant driving. You see that foundation over there, boy? I said, yeah, Grant. He says, uh, um, well, I don't ordinarily, he said, I never drank while I'm working. He said, but 
for some reason, I was working there on a Sunday. Now, this was just an old foundation. It was an old foundation, he said. But for some reason, I was working there on a Sunday. And they said, Ernie, you want to try some of our hard cider? And he said, ah, I was thirsty. I was hot. So I, I had a glass, and it was pretty good. And next thing you know, you had another glass. And for those of you who have ever had drinks before, after you've had a couple, I didn't like that one. So anyway, he said he, he worked on that chimney. And he got, he got so drunk, he was leaning against the post, and he was laying the bricks against the post. <laughs> he left that day. When he came back the next day, he looked at the chimney. He said, God damn it, boy, that was the straightest chimney I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got one job, Mark, about when he worked at the state hospital in the, in the scrub beds. Oh, yeah. yeah Grant uh, did masonry work for the state hospital. And... Uh, you know, there were a lot of the patients that were roaming around, and, and uh, Gramps said, "Well, I gotta go home, and uh, I gotta put I gotta put cow poop on my strawberries." And one of the guys says, "Huh? You call us crazy? We put milk and sugar on ours." <laughs> this, this, this I found in the attic. This was my grandfather's ledger uh, from 1942. Charlie Marsh will appreciate this. Charlie, you should check this out sometime. Uh, there's two places I marked. If, I would leave you here if you want to go through it. It is really fascinating to look at. Um, he worked for um, Andrew Hart, and a lot of it got paid off in potatoes. He, so he, he bartered. Um, but this other one was, you're going to get a kick out of this, Charles. He did a job. doesn't say whether it was a fireplace or what, but he had 26 hours of mason time. Just throw a number out, back in 1942. How much for 26 hours of mason time in 1942? 12.50. How much? 12.50. $39. He had a helper for 17 hours. How much? Five. $12.75. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, a roll of lead, 90 cents, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mason. But just the, just the time and the, and the, the money that, um, it's, it's hard to fathom that, you know. But uh, uh, Grant, uh, he became very good friends with a, uh, oh wait, let me tell this story. Um, just up the hill, it's John and Jan Maggs' house. Now, back when we were kids, it was Earl Parent's farm. And there was a big, beautiful barn, and it, it was the barn that got, you know, got lost in the tornado. And Gramps said to me one day, he said, boy, I was real little. He said, come with me, there's a little boy that lives in the silo up in, that, up in the top of that barn. And uh, come up the road and say hello, and he's going to yell hello back. So we, we, went up to Academy, we went up to Academy Hill, and we just stopped at the corner of Academy Hill. Hill he goes, yell hello, boy. Hello! <laughs> it was an echo. It was a perfect echo, but for a long time I thought it was a little boy. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, I remember years, Grant was very good friends with a poet in town named Archibald McLeish. And Grant used to do a lot of work for Archibald, and I was fortunate enough to tag along with him. And Archibald then had two beautiful ponds full of bass. Full of bass. And, uh, remember, I think probably the first time I ever went there, and Grant says, you know, boy, we're going to go, we're going to work for Archibald. He called him Archie. It was kind of cool, because Archibald was always proper. He'd say, hello, Ernest, and Grant would say, hello, Archie. <laughs> <laughs> so we would stop, and uh, Grant, on the way there, now, boy, do not sit down. Whenever you work for somebody, you don't sit down. You always stay busy. You do something, but don't sit down. You always stay busy. It's all right, man. I'm maybe eight years old, I don't know. We get there, and Grant gets out. Hello, Archie. Hello, Ernest. And they shake their hands, and, I, and uh, they're talking. And I said, Grant, do you want, want me to mix mortar? And uh, he goes, no, boy, why don't you uh, get the pole and go see if you can catch a bass? I said, all right. So I grabbed the fishing pole. I was gone for a long, probably an hour and a half. I'm fishing and fishing. Grant and Archie are walking around, because Archie... Archibald loved his garden, and he always had questions about Grant because Grant loved the, the garden. And uh, he, uh, so finally I got back, and uh, 
Grandpa's all done, and he said, "Yeah, boy, now you can mix the mortar." And the mortar was always the same: three shovels of sand, two shovels of lime, one shovel of cement. Uh, and I mixed it up. And uh, but I guess I, what I learned from that day is, you can go fish for an hour and a half, but for Christ's sake, don't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, Archibald had a cool old. It's still there, and uh, I think Sigler is the name of the people. But who owns that big house up on Pine Hill? Sigler. Is it Sigler? Sigler. The, the Archibald had a house that he used to write in. When you go up and you go around the sharp corner, there's a stone house back to the right. And uh, it's still there, and it was a cool old place, and we used to go and, and point up. But I'll be honest with you, I don't ever remember doing a lot of masonry work. I think Archibald just wanted Grant to come up and have a chat with him, <laughs> talk about the gardens and whatever. But uh, uh, Grant was, I, you know, I've heard a lot of stories how honest he was. Um, Michelle, uh, um, uh, Harris, his grandfather, I used to go visit now and again, he told me, you know, your grandfather is probably the most honest guy I ever met. He said, we made a deal, Ernie was going to, Ernie bought my cow, he couldn't afford the money at the start, but he said he'd pay me a dollar every Friday at 4 o'clock when my chores were done. I said, Ernie, you come give me a dollar after I'm done with my chores. And uh, I don't know, it was probably five dollars. So every Friday afternoon, Grant would walk from the house in Pumpkin Hollow. He would walk to Lawrence Harris's farm to give him a dollar for that cow. Well, it was the last day, the final payment, and all he owed him was one dollar. And there were no vehicles. It was freezing rain, and it was the most miserable day. And and Lawrence said he looked out the window, and here comes Ernie trudging through the snow to give him that last dollar. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Um, uh, when I was young, I was like 16, he'd say, boy, go get me some beer. Now, back then, there was Baxter's. It was Baxter's store. And uh, now, I'm only 16 years old, and uh, don't tell my mom. He would go, <laughs> he'd say, go, go get me some beer. And he'd give me $2, and he drank Peel's Root Dry. So I would go to Baxter's store, and uh, I'd give Ed, and he didn't card me or anything. Ed would just say, oh, Ernie, Ernie needs his beer, so he'd, Give me a six pack of beer, and I'd go back, and Grant had to have that penny. Had to have that penny. Where's that penny? Yeah. But uh, he, he, for those of you who knew him, he, he certainly was a character. Does anybody remember, anybody remember him starting his shirts on fire? He used to smoke a pipe. He would light the pipe, and when, if we'd go ice fishing, his hands would be cold, I'd have to light the pipe for him. But he, he would light his pipe and then he'd shake it once and he'd put it in his pocket. Or he would shake it and put it in his ashtray, depending on where he was. If he was outside the car, it went in his pocket. In the car, it went in his ashtray. I can't tell you how many pockets he burnt off of his shirt. Because not, sometimes that flame doesn't go out with the first shake. So he would shake it and he'd put it in his pocket. And, uh, but one time he was in Greenfield and uh, he started his car on fire. And he had shotgun shells on the dashboard, and the firefighters couldn't get close enough because the shotgun shells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, he didn't put the matches out. He threw them on the dash while they were burning. That's right, Howard. Because yeah. he used to pick me up, give me a ride home from Frontier, and he'd light his pipe and he'd throw it burning on the dash. And I would go. It's on fire. It'll happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was known to bite the head or two off of a fish. Well, for those of you who remember the wall over here before the, the flood took it out, there was what they called the wall. And the, all the kids would go down and fish, and he'd go down, what do you got there, boy? He'd grab one of the fish just to he'd bite the fish's head off. <laughs> yeah, probably not the best in them for a lot of you, but it's just, that's kind of just the way he was. He ate a few worms today. What's that? Ate a few words. Ate a few words, yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I don't know where we are with time, but. Oh, I think we're going to after 8, so you're doing fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's all I prepared. I could have prepared a lot more, but I didn't want to. Is there some other item on your table or the. Uh... Oh, oh, yeah. This is how I was going to start. This has nothing to do with, with my grandfather, it does have to do with the house. But about eight, I don't know, 12 years or so ago, I was working on the house. I tore all the clapboards off the side of the house. And I was getting ready to put new clapboards on and repaint. 
and I tore all the way down and I had some old rotted sheathing right there and just that was sticking out underneath the, 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 the bottom of the sheathing and I thought it was the end of an old rusted off electric cable so I tore the, the board off and this was in behind the wall of a house who the heck would put a, a bayonet in behind the wall of a house it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? The house is over there. Oh, without question, Jay. However, that addition would be right around that time because that, that part of the house was an addition. But uh, this is a 1911 bayonet. It's a U.S. made. Why it was there, who knows? But I remember. All right. Is he working on the ball field when they created the ball field? I'm sorry? Did he work at the ball field when they changed the, the grade of the ball field? He, he, you know. He worked there with my father. Okay, he but probably did. Uh, Barry. I him the same age. Uh-huh. Did he ever tell you a story about the accident they had coming down from Ashfield? Uh, tell us. <laughs> so he, he always wore a, a back support. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they had two girls from Greenfield. <laughs> They're up to Ashfield to the dance, and they had to be back in Greenfield at midnight. And my dad had a star, off in the wind. And they're coming down through South Ashfield, and they finally got off the road and hit a culvert, and Ernie wound up ahead of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when he broke his nose? Yeah, just when he said that. He broke his nose, and he, he watched this boy. He pushed his nose, and he'd sneeze every time. <laughs> <laughs> he did something to his nose. Was it that accident? I don't know. <laughs> Barry, Barry Parker tells a funny story about how a long, long time ago, I don't know, early 80s, there was a terrible rainstorm. And in fact, a lot of bridges got washed out in town at the time. And Grandpa's home, and Barry, I think it was an EMT at the time, he went knocking on the door. He said, Ernie, because of the rain and everything, the Conway pool is getting really full. And that dam's made of earth. He said, we're afraid it's... It's going to burst. He says, I know it's made of earth. I helped build the goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it ain't going to burst if I'm still here. <laughs> Mark? Yes. I have a, a couple of Ernie stories. Yes, here. Um, uh, I've been in town a long time, since uh, 1971. And, and in 1974, I was a young carpenter working for Walter Goodrich, who was building a house in Ashby. And Ernie was hired to do the fireplace. And I got the tent oh, joy. for Ernie. Oh, joy. Boy, more mud, boy, he would yell at me. And he would chew tobacco. He spit it on your feet? So, no, he'd spit it into the mortar. Yeah. And so he's, I'm running around trying to keep up with him. He's old at that point. He's 74, right? But he's spitting and mixing this mud up. And then he'd sl it was a field stone, beautiful field stone fireplace. And he'd just keep slapping it on and mud it, and, and after you'd come back and you'd look, and then you could see where the streaks of the tobacco juice had the part <laughs> got mixed in with the water. <laughs> and then a number of years later, we live up the top of the hill, Old Cricket Hill, you know, Ernie and uh, Jonas, our son, was six, so this is probably 1984, like 10 years later. And he would let us come down and dig worms, I'll bet. Great place for digging sure. worms. Yeah. And then, he said, go up, the, go up, and he, he'd call everybody, boy. Said, boy go, up, go up to the Asheville Lake, boy, and go out at the point. And he said, you'll catch some, you'll catch some bullheads with these, you know, he told him. And he said, when you come back, well, this is going to be tough for some people. So when you come back, what you want to do with the bullheads is you want to take a board and a nail, and you want to nail the bullhead to the board. And then you want to take the skin and cut it right here. And then you get your pair of pliers, and you pull that skin off of the thing. And my son, Jonas, is kind of like, <laughs> uh, and then he said, come on in, come on in the house, boy, I'll, I'll, I'll give you something to drink. So we went in the house, and there on the table were two raccoons, <laughs> and they're dead on the table. And he said, don't, don't mind those boys, I, 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 I killed them a while back, I haven't got, I didn't get a chance to clean them, so I put them in the freezer, and now they're defrosted, and I'll, I'll skin them up tonight, and then we'll have raccoons. Yeah, back in, I can remember back in the day, the house would be, there would be raccoon pelts hanging from everything inside the house. You know? Jonas got a My grandmother education. had to have been a saint. She came from Brooklyn. She was a senior. Yes. Our freezer hasn't changed one day. Yes, I'm guilty as Chuck. Larry Record, Grant spit in his cup one, coffee cup one time. Oh, yeah. uh, Larry, Larry loved Grant, but I didn't. <laughs>
dirty. He, he spit me. Well, I have to tell the story about my mother when she first came. Stand up. Can you stand up and turn around? Because so, come on, we'll be able to hear you. Yeah. When my mom first came to Conway, uh, she packed nice fried chicken, she said, and she had a wonderful lunch. And somewhere in my Holland Cemetery, they're having a picnic on the blanket. My father came along and threw a skunk on the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Razor with his buddies from Chicopee? I don't. Jim. Well, you don't. Uh, they yeah. came up. They came up. Tommy, our I cousin. Mean, there's a I could have gone on forever, but I didn't yeah, want to. Well, our cousin from Chicopee oh. came to go hunting. They wanted to shoot squirrels, and and Grant says, uh, Jesus Christ, boy! He goes, you go up past the Auntie's farm. He goes, you park in some pull off up there. He goes, you cross, get over the fence. You go across the meadow. He goes, there's a row of trees. You get through through that row of trees, and then there's a big tree that looks like this. Tommy <laughs> <laughs> said, all of his buddies and him from Chickabee are like, a tree that looks like this. <laughs> and they went out, and then there was a, he goes, there'll be more goddamn squirrels than you can shoot in a day there. And he goes, and low, go, take a right at the tree. That's what he goes, you see the tree look like this, you take a right, there'll be a grove over there, and you go shoot squirrels, and they shot squirrels all day over in that yeah. grove. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, between me and Uncle Dick, they knew the land, that's for sure. Yeah. Mark, Mark, wasn't there an interesting a story between Lester Stevens, the town artist, and uh, your dad. There's some kind of a job that uh, bad one. I don't know. Just I can tell you that story. Who knows it? Uh, that's a great story. They bartered. My daughter yes. has a beautiful that's, painting. Oh yeah, Lester I Stevens. do know that. Yes. Yeah. And he said, my mother invited. Can everyone here, Mary Lou? <laughs> What's the name of the artist? Yeah, Mary Lou. Lester, Lester, Stevens. Lester Stevens. My mother invited me to dinner with us, and she had pickled beets, and he was a very cool gentleman. I'm sorry, but he took it easy. <laughs> well, I think the story Joe says of um, <laughs> he did some work for Lester Stevens, and Lester would yeah, Grant did a, a, a bunch of work for Lester Stevens, and Lester gave him a paint. Yeah, that's right. Instead of painting the house, I think. Uh, he, yeah. There's communication. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the exact back story. But, uh, well, that's all I've prepared, folks, so hopefully I didn't bore you all. And, uh,